Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Our analysis whenever we're presented with a business venture is meticulously thorough. What are the startup costs? How many partners are involved? What's the likely return on investment? And so on. Thorough. In many cases, however, it may not even occur to one of us to ask the most important of all questions in this business venture. What is the Islamic ruling of it? Is it halal? And the Prophet wasallam had prophesied that such a day would arrive. He said, يَأْتِ عَلَى النَّاسِ زَمَانٌ لَا يُبَالِي الْمَرْءُ مِنْ أَيْنِ مِنْ أَيْنَ أَخَذْ أَمِنْ حَلَالٍ أَمْ مِنْ حَرَامٍ A time will come where people will not care regarding what they take from, whether it's from halal or haram. And what is interesting is that when the Qur'an spoke of zina, adultery, it elaborated on its consequences and denounced it with the harshest of expressions. The same can be said about other sins like alcohol and theft and backstabbing, uh, false accusations and so on. Yet when the Qur'an approached the topic of finances, specifically the using of riba, interest, the language of the Qur'an changes to a completely different tone. Allah said, فَإِن لَمْ تَفْعَلُوا فَأَذَنُوا بِحَرْبٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ That if you do not desist, meaning if you do not desist from interest, then what? Then take notice of war from Allah and His Messenger. Commenting on this, Abdullah ibn Abbas, he said, يُقَالُوا يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ لِآكِلِ الرِّبَى خُذْ سِلَاحَكَ لِلْحَرْبِ On the Day of Judgment, it will be said to the user of interest, go and fetch your weaponry and prepare for war. Imagine how embarrassing, how humiliating and disgracing this is. But such is the seriousness of finances in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's important to matter, uh, clarify a matter at this point. What is meant by prohibited wealth? Haram money. Is it exclusive to the obvious sources of haram, like through alcohol, drugs, gambling, theft, interest? No, in reality, the, the concept is far wider than that. It encompasses, count with me, it encompasses number one, earnings that are sourced from the impermissible avenues, like the selling of drugs and alcohol and tobacco. Number two, it includes the impermissible products as well from where the money is made, like pork and alcohol, even if it's purchased from halal wealth. It also includes, number three, the permissible products, vegetables, fruits, beef, right? When it's purchased from haram wealth. So the concept is, is wide. In fact, the concept of prohibited wealth is, is, is so far reaching that the scholars have even discussed the ruling of an employee praying voluntary units without the permission of his employer. So the obligatory salah, there's no problem in this. Okay, as for the rawatib, the extra sunnah prayers associated with the obligatory ones, scholars have two opinions. There's a group that say there's no permission required, um, that because they're very emphasized in status. And then you have another uh, group of scholars who say that no permission is required. And as for the non-specific voluntary units of prayer, Imam Ahmad's fatwa was of the view that one shouldn't engage in them if they will minimize the employer's benefit in any way. Why? To make your money halal. So those lecturers, for example, who purposely arrive late to lectures, that they're being paid to deliver, or those who use their working hours to do their shopping, to recreationally surf the internet, to engage in business ventures, to take their children somewhere, so on. This money, in many cases that you've earned, you hadn't worked for it, and may come under the same heading of prohibited wealth. So, so do you see just how encompassing this expression is of prohibited wealth, and how serious our sharia views it? So if you've allowed this type of money into your account, this means that you've unleashed a weapon of mass destruction against yourself and your family. The danger of this weapon is that its effects, they're not always noticeable. It doesn't make sounds. It doesn't tear down buildings. 
doesn't release any toxic smell. Nevertheless, it is so ruthless in its effect that it has this power to single-handedly devastate your dunya and your deen, and the casualties are beyond count. And I just want to share with you for the sake of this video a few of those casualties. The first casualty of prohibited wealth in the life of a believer is your heart. The same way that certain foods are damaging to the physical heart, fast food, uh, burgers, uh, processed foods, cured meats, deep fried foods, so on, foods that block the natural passage of blood through its arteries, there are certain matters that also damage your spiritual heart, causing a blocking of the passage of Iman, and happiness and sakina, tranquility, well-being, inner well-being, on one of which is prohibited wealth. And that's why the Prophet وسلم, said, That when a servant of Allah commits a sin, a black spot is placed on his heart. If he then withdraws and seeks for forgiveness and repents, his heart is polished clean. He said, but if he returns to the sin, it will be made to increase until it is covered. His heart is completely covered. And he said, this is the, the ran, the stain, which Allah mentioned. Their, there is a ran on their hearts because of what they used to do. So what happens as a result of such a covering? Well, you fail to enjoy the sweetness of Islam. You fail to benefit from advice. You struggle to engage your heart in salah. You, you struggle to activate your heart in dua, in the recitation of the Qur'an. Mercy and kindness is taken away from, from, from a person's heart. Patience and positivity, they're stripped from a person's heart. Your heart becomes hard. And as a result, even though you, you may take your body to the places of goodness, mosques and Islamic lectures and, and gatherings of remembrance, you feel like you've left your heart somewhere else every single time. Like a car that simply fails to start. And you ask in desperation, what's wrong with me? And had your heart had the ability to speak, it would say to you, it's your prohibited wealth that's suffocating me. It's your money that's suffocating me. That's the first casualty, your heart. The second casualty of allowing prohibited wealth into your life is your sadaqah, your charity. Due to the prohibited wealth that you refuse to investigate and avoid, you have successfully managed to close the door of charity between you and Allah. And the fact that your zakah comes under this category should terrify you and terrify me. The Prophet ﷺ said, Man jama'a malan haraman thumma tasaddaqa bihi lam yakun lahu fihi ajr wa kana isruhu alayhi. Whoever accumulates prohibited wealth, then gives it out in charity. He will not be rewarded for it and will have to bear the consequences of the sin of it as well. Subhanallah. So you may ask, how is it that my charity will not purify me from my sins? Sufyan al he answers this question. And he, he says, مَنْ أَنْفَقَ الْحَرَامَ فِي الطَّاعَةِ كَانَ كَمَنْ طَهَرَ الثَّوْبَ بِالْمَوْلِ وَالثَّوْبُ لَا يُطَهِرُهُ إِلَّا الْمَاءِ وَالذَّنْبُ لَا يُكَفِرُهُ إِلَّا الْحَلَالِ He says, whoever spends prohibited wealth in avenues of goodness is just like a person who tries to clean his clothes with urine. He said, clothes cannot be purified except with water and sins cannot be erased except with the halal. Allahu Akbar. That's the second casualty, your sadaqah, your charity. The third casualty of allowing prohibited wealth into your life is your dua. What good is there in the life of a person when the rope of dua between him and Allah has been severed? Such a person will be left to himself. His voice of dua has become of no interest to Allah. The Prophet وسلم, made mention of a man who يطيل السفر أشعث أغبر يمد يديه إلى السماء يا رب يا رب ومطعمه حرام ومشربه حرام وملبسه حرام وغذي بالحرام فأنا يستجاب لذلك A person who was journeying a long distance and he was disheveled and dusty and he's spreading out his hands to the sky in dua saying my lord, my lord, my lord 
The Prophet said, but his food is haram, his drink is haram, his clothing is haram, and he has been nourished with the haram, so how can his dua be answered? How can his dua be answered? Look at this hadith. Allahu Akbar. All of the means of an accepted dua were with this person. Remember, he is traveling. He's in a humble state. He's raising his hands in dua. He's repeating his dua. All of these things usually produce an accepted dua. Yet, all of these elements combined did nothing for him because his wealth was haram. And it's well known that Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas, uh, his dua was answered by Allah every single time. And he was asked the question that why is it that from all of the companions of the Prophet وسلم, it's your dua that is answered. How come? And his answer was very clear. He said, مَا رَفَعْتُ إِلَىٰ ثَمِي لُقْمَةً إِلَّا وَأَنَا عَالِمْ مِنْ أَيْنَ جَاءَتْ وَمِنْ أَيْنَ خَرَجَتْ Because in my life, he said, I have not raised any bit of food to my mouth without knowing the details of where it was sourced. Allahu Akbar. That's the third casualty of someone who allows haram wealth into his or her life. The dua. The fourth casualty of, for someone who allows haram wealth into their life, your acts of worship at large. So the harm of prohibited wealth is not limited to dua, but it extends its cancerous roots to every aspect of your worship, your salah, and your fast, and your hajj, uh, your worship in general. Is all of the money in the world worth it? And that's why Al-Ghazali, he said, Al-ibadatu ma'a akli al-harami kal bina'i ala amwaj al-bihar. That a person's worship, whilst consuming the prohibited, is like constructing a building on top of the waves of the oceans. No foundations, no base. And Ibn Abbas, he would say, لا يقبل الله صلاة امرئ في جوفه حرام Allah does not accept the salah of a person who has prohibited within him, meaning the reward is rejected. You still have to carry it out, but the reward, where is the reward? So how tragic it would be to have your thousands of pounds, dollars that maybe you'd spent on, say, Hajj, and uh, the weeks that you'd spent away from family and comfort, rejected. What a, what a, a calamity. So how accurate were the words of a poet who said, إِذَا حَجَجْتَ بِمَالٍ أَصْلُهُ دَنَسْ فَمَا حَجَجْتَ وَلَكِنْ حَجَّةِ الْعِيرُ لَا يَقْبَلُ اللَّهُ إِلَّا كُلَّ طَيِّبَةٍ مَا كُلُّ مَنْ حَجَّ بَيْتَ اللَّهِ مَبْرُورُ he said that if you've performed Hajj from wealth that's sourced from impurity, then you didn't perform Hajj, but your animal did. <laughs> he said Allah did not, does not accept only that which is pure. Therefore realize that not every Hajj is mabrur, meaning accepted. That's the fourth casualty. Your acts of worship at large. The fifth casualty of allowing prohibited wealth into your life, your barakah, the blessings. With this devastating weapon of prohibited wealth, the barakah in your life will begin to experience the throes of death. And the true extent of this loss can only be appreciated when we understand what the concept of barakah is. So what is barakah? We translate it loosely as blessing. What is barakah? What is blessing? Al-Raghibu al-Asfahani, he said, Al-Barakah hiya thubut al-khayr al-ilahi fi shay Al-Barakah is when Allah allows goodness from him to remain in something. To remain. This concept of thubut, remaining, is integral to the understanding of the word barakah. Something that stays. And that's why when a camel uh, kneels down in the Arabic language, it's described as doing what? Barakah, barakah al-ba'ir. Yeah, barakah al-ba'ir. The camel has barakah because it's staying where it is. And an area where, 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 where water is collected, the Arabs would call it a birka. Why? Because water remains. So barakah is when goodness stays in something from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And take it as a rule in life. There can be no happiness in the absence of barakah. Because when barakah mixes with something that is small in quantity, it causes it to grow. And when it mixes with something already uh, huge and profound, it makes it beneficial. So should barakah become part of your wealth, or your health, or your time, or your children, or your knowledge, or anything else? it becomes far more productive, far more beneficial in its effect. It becomes a means of your success and happiness. And on top of that, their effects remain. 
So we need barakah in our lives. And the person who has this will be able to achieve far more than those who do not, despite the hours of the day being identical in the lives of both. I mean, think about Sa'd ibn Mu'adh. How old was he when he became Muslim? 30 years old. And he died just six years later at the young age of 36. Yet his life was full of barakah. So blessed his life was that when he died, the throne of Allah Almighty would shake. What must he have done within those six years to achieve the status? Barakah. So we need barakah in our hours. A person who has barakah in his time is able to visit parents, able to pray in the masjid, requires few hours of sleep, and more importantly has the opportunities of collecting good deeds during the day as well. Others who have no barakah in their time, however, they need endless hours of sleep, they still feel sluggish. During the day, there's hardly any time to do anything productive, to visit family, to make money, to worship Allah. Then we also need barakah in our money. A person who has this uh, feels pleased with what Allah has given him or her. The car tires, they don't always need replacement. Uh, appliances at home, they're not always breaking down. And uh, although the income is not great, but the barakah of this money means that you're able to suffice yourself and your family, and you're able to spend on charity as well, and everyone is content. On the other hand, some may have millions coming in each month, but because the barakah is missing, they find themselves in debt, or spiritually lost, or experiencing inner poverty, afraid of being poor, unable to solve the jigsaw puzzle of life, spending their money on medication. We need barakah in our knowledge as well. A person who has barakah in his knowledge finds each ayah or hadith transformational in terms of what it does for him or her's conduct, worship, appearance, hijab, habits, and so on. Others, however, who have no barakah in their knowledge may sit in tens or hundreds of sermons, lectures, reminders, watching videos like this. But then when they assess their inner and outer state, no change. No change. There is no barakah in knowledge. And barakah in children. A person who has barakah in their children finds that his children are inshallah righteous. They're dutiful. They bring happiness to themselves. They bring happiness to their parents. They bring happiness to their communities. And this person may be an only child. But that child grows to become a reformer, a revivalist, a, a worshipper of Allah or their likes. On the other hand, a couple may be parents to say 10 children. But because there's no barakah in them, their behavior is deplorable. They neglect their parents. They, uh, worse still, they lack the motivation to be proper Muslims. They're always at the rock bottom. So the point of mentioning all of this long elaboration is to say that with prohibited money, baraka will be your casualty number five. The sixth casualty in the lives of those who allow prohibited money into their lives, the door of halal. The doors of halal begin to close. It's a bitter reality, but it's true. It's one that states that whoever rushes to bring his rizq, his provisions, via a door of haram, an equivalent door of halal will be closed in his or her life. And what's interesting is that in many cases, for those who opt for the prohibited sources of income, they are actually the least in need of it. This person may already have several properties to his name, several sources of income, a reasonable saving, yet it doesn't stop them from pursuing the impermissible. How do you explain that? Honestly, how do you understand that other than saying the doors of halal have been vaulted shut before them? Tawfiq has been taken away. And that's why it was narrated that Ali ibn Abi Talib once entered a mosque in Kufa and requested a young boy to take hold of his animal whilst he prays inside. When Ali finished his prayer, he put his hand in his pocket and he took out a dinar with the intention of giving it to the child as a thanks, but he found that the child had stolen the saddle and run away with it. So Ali instead gave the dinar to another person and he said, go to the marketplace for me and buy me a saddle, I gotta get home. The man came back with a saddle and Ali said, SubhanAllah, this is my saddle. The man said, yeah, I mean, I brought it from a young man in the marketplace for one dinar. And Ali said, SubhanAllah. He said, Subhanallah, I wanted, to, I wanted to benefit this young man with this dinar 
in a permissible way, but he insisted to take it in the prohibited way. SubhanAllah. Doors of halal will close in the life of this person who insists on prohibited wealth. The seventh casualty in the lives of those who allow prohibited wealth into their lives, their safety underground, the moment of soul and body separation will be for a lot of people the beginning of a brand new phase of peace and comfort as angels rush to spoil these people in their graves. Others, however, the grave represents a new episode of unimaginable suffering and the companionship of angels who rush to apply the cruelest forms of torture on them. One of the factors that differentiates between these two outcomes is how a person had sourced his or her wealth. Should it be from the prohibited source, even martyrdom will not intercede for you. Imagine. And that's why when the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, heard companions congratulating the soul of a Muslim, Mid'am, who died after receiving a stray arrow to his body during one of the battles, the expedition of Khaybar, they said, congratulations for him. He has entered paradise. And the Prophet said to them, Kalla walladhi nafsi biyadihi. No. No, no, no. I swear by the one who possesses my soul. Inna shamlata alati akhadaha yawma khaybara min al-maghanimi lam tusibha al-maqasim latashta'inu alayhi naran. He said, no. I swear by the one who possesses my soul. He took a shawl from the spoils of khaybar before it was correctly distributed, and so its flames are now covering him. People were horrified to hear this, and so one man came to return one or two leather shoelaces that he'd also taken. And he said, I took these on the day of Khaybar. He gave them back. And so the Prophet ﷺ said to him, Shirakun aw shirakani fin nar. Those were one or two shoelaces from hell. So, if this is the outcome for someone who added to his possessions something prohibited on the off chance, what then do you make of a person whose day to day is like that? Day to day. What kind of surprises await such a person? That's casualty number seven. As for casualty number eight, in the lives of those who allow prohibited wealth into their lives, your home in Jannah. Imagine the tears of regret that some will shed on the Day of Judgment when paradise is within sight, but they're prohibited from walking through its gates because of prohibited wealth. The Prophet ﷺ said to the companion, Ka'b, Ya Ka'b ibn Ujra, innahu la yadkhulu al-jannata lahmun wa dabun nabata ala suhtin an naru awla bihi aw Ka'b ibn Ujra any person whose flesh and blood was nourished through the impermissible cannot enter paradise. The hellfire is worthy of them. In conclusion, easy returns and quick turnovers. Yeah, maybe this is the type of money that the prohibited sources may bring. But beware of convincing yourself that this has anything to do with success. It is simply impossible to disobey Allah Almighty and then succeed just as it is impossible to obey Allah and then fail. Whilst noting that success and failure are not measured by what you see in the hands of people today, but in the outcomes. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا رَأَيْتَ اللَّهَ يُعْطِي الْعَبْدَ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا he said والسلام, that if you see that Allah is giving someone from this life all what he wishes whilst this person is engaged upon that which is wrong then know that Allah is baiting this person to their destruction. And then the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, recited the verse in the Quran which confirms this meaning. When they forgot our reminder, we opened for them the gates of every good. Until they became proud with what we gave them. We took them away suddenly. And lo and behold, they were plunged into destruction. Now, if you are given the option between two paths, 
one that's downhill and fully paved and scenic and safe and fragrant, but it ends in a bottomless pit. And then a second path that's uphill, dark, rough in its terrain, but you know what? It ends in a top class chalet. It ends with a swimming pool, it ends with an all you can eat buffet. Which of the two paths would people opt for? Ah, so clearly and evidently, success and failure, they're to be measured by the eventual destination, not by the ease or difficulty of the journey to that destination. And with these types of casualties associated with prohibited wealth, what good is there left in the life of a person? We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to inspire us to make the correct decisions.